Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this short course on materials, technologies, and applications in nuclear fusion. Here is an overview of the contents. I have slightly changed the arrangement. Today we will focus on basics, which means deformation and <coughs> damage mechanisms in general, and in the second part on the irradiation damage especially. The next few days, part two concentrates more or less on steels. And I'm sure we have to skip the one or other subchapter, so it's up to you to select what is most interesting for you. And the final part, maybe we can shorten a little bit since the lecture in the morning was already on tungsten materials. But Let's go right into deformation and damage mechanisms, the topics of today. Why do we focus on metals? I think that's an easy to answer question. That's simply due to the operating temperature and due to the structural applications which are possible by metals, but not by polymers, not by ceramics, and uh, not in any case by natural materials or foams. My <coughs> strategy is to focus on basic design issues and in general to focus on the basic material properties. You probably all know more or less about that, so consider it just as a review. But from uh, my point of view, I follow sometimes a bit another strategy. Let's see how it works out. Then the scheme and strategy of this lecture is to always make an observation, collecting facts. Then, uh, if possible, let's set up some models and see what they predict and how they can increase our understanding. And finally, this should increase our knowledge and we should be able to reduce general facts on simple or single mechanisms and principles. And finally, from that, we can draw or should be able to draw conclusions which have an impact on the design. So this is more uh, focused on engineering sciences, as I assume is also in your interest. Uh, if you have time, you can read the sources. Maybe one is worth to mention. YouTube, I consider in general also as a good source for uh, information. You will see, I will show you some videos from that. The contents of this lecture is uh, quite easy. We start from the crystalline lattice, go through all the material behavior and end up with fracture properties, creep, and fatigue properties. Let's start with the crystalline lattice in metals. Here is the observation. You all know this. It's possible by transmission electron microscopy to visualize even single atoms, as you can see on the right-hand side. If you screen through the lattice, here are the single atoms. They are arranged lattice structured and by diffraction of electrons you see these diffraction patterns. And this is, for example, why we know that metals are struct uh, structured by a lattice or have a metal lattice. The atomic structure of metals is a result of a many-body system in pure metals, the atoms reaches a, sta a state of minimum energy if they are arranged periodically and as dense as possible. And the very simple picture is that the single atoms, or let's say ions, move in a general sea of electrons. So the positive charged ions are repelling as well as are the negative electrons each other and the ion and electron gases are attracting. And as a consequence, metals are good heat and electrical conductors. And another conclusion you can already draw from this picture is that metals are highly ductile because the atoms can be easily shifted and so the material can be easily deformed. <coughs> 
Another important thing is to consider each of these metal atoms moving in a field because each atom is uh, interacting with the atoms around it. So if we repel or if we uh, bring two atoms near together, there is a repelling force, which shows here the repelling potential or the repelling bond energy. If you move them apart, then uh, this is the attractive potential or the attractive for forces, if you make the derivative of that. And combined, we end up in a description of uh, bond energy of two atoms, which has a minimum. And the minimum is a perfect measure to describe the force or the bonding of a metal. If you compare this with ionic or covalent bonds, metals are a bit lower in the range. Uh, let's say there are that they are in the range of several hundred kilojoule per mole. And um, the property which is directly connected to the depths of this potential well is the uh, melting temperature, but also the elastic modulus, Young's modulus. And if you would compare different bond energies of different metals, you could easily see by comparison which metal has a higher melting point or a higher elastic modulus. If we increase the temperature of starting from zero K, you see that atoms are moving. That's due to the temperature. And if you focus on the lattice atoms, you see that the atoms in the lattice are also moving back and forth. They are oscillating. That's a fact due to the temperature. Within our picture of bonding energy or bonding forces, this would mean if we start from zero Kelvin, increase the temperature, then the potential energy of a single <coughs> atom is increased, and then it could move from the left to the right hand side of the potential curve. If you increase it further, it can even oscillate more. And now you see the potential well is asymmetric, and so the mean value is shifted from the initial position towards to higher values. And as a result, we experience or see expansion of the lattice. If we would have uh, another shape, which is uh, symmetrically, we wouldn't see a thermal expansion of metal. So within this picture, it's also a very easy conclusion. The minimum energy, this is what leads to a lattice. The metallic bonds, uh, from this we can conclude that atoms are easy to displace because they are easily to be moved within the electron C. This is the result for high plasticity in metals, high thermal conductivity, and also high electric conductivity. <coughs> the interaction potential gives an explanation for the melting temperature, gives an explanation for Young's modulus, and also explains thermal expansion. What is the impact on engineering and design? If you compare the Young's modulus of different metals over the temperature, you see aluminum as a low modulus, steel medium, tungsten very high. So the higher the melting point, this was the conclusion from, from the uh, potentials, the higher the young modulus. And within the same material, for example in steel, with rising temperature the atomic forces go down because it needs more energy for the thermal movement and so there is less energy for the bonding and this simply reduces the elastic modulus. So even these curves are easily dis explained by the simple model of the lattice. Now let's come to the tensile properties. You all know the usual tensile test and the resulting curve. 
here we have the part where we have only elastic deformation and where we could derive the elastic modulus from. Then uh, at the point of yield, we have the onset or start begin of the uh, work hardening of plastic deformation. So yield strength, this is one typical tensile measurement and value. The ultimate tensile strength, that's the maximum point in this stress strain curve. And from then on, the material uh, contradicts. It shows necking and finally fractures. Connected to the ultimate tensile strength, we have uh, in terms of strain, uniform elongation and total elongation. This is the usual picture and how you do tensile testing and their evaluation. Characteristic values are four, yield strengths, ultimate tensile strengths, and uniform and total elongation. If we have a look on the properties depending on temperature, you see here this black curve starts at room temperature and then going down temperature increases up to 700 C for the example of a 9% chromium steel. What you also see is besides the strength in general decreasing with temperature that the uniform elongation that's uh, <coughs> the strain up to the maximum point is significantly reduced with higher temperatures and also in general with higher temperature, the elongation, the total elongation of the specimen increase. That's the observation. <coughs> Can we explain these properties with our simple model for the metallic bonds or lattice? Let's do a test. If we simplify or use the simplified atomistic model and let's say we have the indirection potential for a specific metal. Then we can derive the indirection force because the first derivation gives you the force and if you sum up all indirection of a single atoms with its surrounding atoms you have the total force and of course you also have to consider the direction <coughs> of the force. This is a simple vector uh, analysis or vector algebraic calculation. So what we can do is to measure or um, calculate the final resulting force on each single atom in a lattice. And if we have that and the mass of the atoms, well, Newton's equations, that's uh, quite simple to deal with. We can apply them, solve them, and in the end we could for time, for any time, time step, have the total information of the multi-atom system in terms of position and velocity. If you do this, this is generally called molecular dynamics. Let's do it and see how it works to explain tensile properties. Uh, if we take, for example, 2,000 atoms here, fix three layers, on the one end and move three layers of the atoms on the other end, then that's nothing else as a tensile test. And um, if we do this, it looks like that. So that's a tensile test on the atomic level based on our simple model. And well, if you are experienced with the one or other tensile tests, you already see that the strain here is immense high. You never observe this in a real tensile specimen. For example, uh, well, this point here marks the initial length, and if we go to the end, you see we have a total strain of more than 100% and usually you don't see such a, much, uh, uh, such a long elongation in tensile strength. If we want to see the, or want to have a measure for the yield strength, we have to go approximately to that point. 
At that point, if you would relax the specimen, it would go right back. So we have just elastic deformation here at that point. And well, even then, a rough approximation shows you that yielding takes place at uh, elongations <laughs> around 10%. And you know from all materials, it's only in the range of 0.2 or 0.1 percent. So as a conclusion, the result doesn't show the reality here. The theoretical yield strength we would measure or measure within such an experiment equals about 1 15th of the Young's modulus. And uh, this has been done for aluminum, which has an elastic modulus of around 70 gigapascal. And here, the theoretical yield strength would be 4,600 megapascals. But in reality, we know that aluminum, depending on the uh, impurity content, is uh, in any case less than 60 MPa. So 4,600 compared to 60 MPa <coughs> That's the error we see in the model. So strength is overestimated. Ductility is also overestimated. And if you compare this uh, with other materials, the prediction is at that line, which uh, equals to 1 15th of Young's modulus. And you see that ultra pure metals, and this was the model to take ultra pure metals in reality, are much, much lower by several orders of magnitudes. <laughs> so what is wrong with our model? The answer comes here. We have performed the calculation with only 2,000 atoms, which is really a tiny, tiny bit of material. In reality, you know, uh, a few grams of a material correspond to, well, 10 to 23 or, or, or more atoms. So the next approach is we just use more model uh, atoms. So in this case, these are a few billion atoms. And well, in that case, I cannot show, or the simulation cannot show all the atoms. So what you will see in a second are just those atoms which are not on their perfect lattice place. The movie will show only atoms which are moved away from their lattice site. And now this is what you, what's happening if you deform materials starting from a perfect lattice. You immediately see strange features uh, evolve, especially <coughs> at the regions where we have notches. And this is the real lattice during plastic deformation. You see all these lines, <laughs> these junctions, they end up at surfaces. It's a, yeah, a big mess, I would say. But I would like to have you consider real plastic deformation, real lattices, lattices in this way and not in the perfect that is where you usually see it in books or have it in mind. So if we use a larger model, there is another feature coming into play. And this obviously is the source for the discrepancy between the theoretical strengths and the real strengths of materials. Of course, you already know these things are called dislocations. To conclude, a perfect and small lattice doesn't describe strength and ductility in macroscopic volumes. However, the model was not so wrong. If you consider nano-structured materials, then indeed the strength is much higher than uh, in, in microscopic materials. So uh, this model better applies to what you frequently see in science fiction movies. That's nanowires where you can uh, lift up weights in the uh, to space stations and whatever, nanostructured materials, all these topics, but engineering materials, real macroscopic materials don't show the strength. So there is a fundamental <laughs> mechanism that occurs in these larger models. That is, the lattice is never perfect. It shows dislocations. 
And if the model is correct, this location, this location should be observable also in real materials. And also, of course, you already know, if you make a TEM observation and uh, strain the sample under microscope, you see this dislocations move. They are interacting, they are repelling, they are attracting. They move really through the material during deformation. Also, what we can see is dislocations um, can replicate themselves or rather multiply in a huge um, amount. In this case, we have a dislocation source which continuously produces much, much more dislocations inside the lattice. Another observ observation uh, from here you see that there are obviously obstacles for dislocation movements. Dislocations here pile up. They can't move through this uh, grain boundary. They are stacked here. They also are bound to, to uh, specific defect in the lattice. And so there are obviously obstacles. Obstacles for dislocations can be other dislocations as well as grain boundaries and precipitates or what other, uh, whatever defects in the perfect lattice. What you know from textbooks compared to reality seems now to be a rather oversimplified uh, picture. That's true. That's why I have shown you the other pictures. If you generally look in um, small specimens, you will see after or during plastic deformation um, many dislocations. They form up networks. And the simplified picture for one dislocation is that it can be, uh, that in generally it's not straight, can be a mix of screw and edge dislocation. This part here is what we call a screw dislocation. This you know as an edge dislocation. A more simple picture would be to consider dislocations like rubber bands. They always try to be as short as possible, but they can expand and they can be strained and stressed throughout the whole lattice. So dislocation density would be an important measure for any crystal lattice. And if you sum up the whole length of all dislocations in a certain volume and divide it by the volume, then you end up in a unit one by square unit, that's one by square millimeter or one by square centimeter. And if we have a annealed, a soft um, metallic volume in the order of a pinhead, one cube millimeter, then you would observe a total length of dislocations of one kilometer in a pinhead, which is already a quite <laughs> big amount. But if you cold work, if you plastically deform this pinhead, then after this uh, deformation, the dislocation multiply, the dislocation density increase up to 10,000 kilometers in the same volume. And this approximately gives you an uh, experience about the real behavior in lattices. Um, to move this location, it needs relatively small forces. And this is the reason why uh, metals uh, in reality show this high plasticity, higher than we predicted with our modeling before. All these are textbook explanation. This is an edge dislocation which can be moved or which will be moved to the surface. Also here dislocation movement and we end up in a plastically deformed piece of lattice. Well, it's up to you to decide whether this textbook simplification or remember the video gives you a more or a better description of reality. Uh, also an analogy why dislocation movement is much easier um, is with this carpet buckle. In order to move a carpet in one movement uh, along the floor, 
um, compared to moving just a buckle that's also often seen in uh, textbooks. For screw dislocations, the analogy is not so easy. It's more or less uh, like a set of beams which you push one by one instead of all them together. So there are analogies for screw and for edge dislocations. But as a summary, dislocation motion, that's gliding, that's called gliding, is the basic underlying mechanism for plasticity and strength. During plastic deformation, we have seen there is a multiplication of dislocations. They interact, they are, can be repulsive or attractive, they can block the gliding of each other. They can, or dislocation in general, move on preferred glide planes and they are bound to these glide planes. And um, we also have seen that there are many different uh, possibilities for obstacles to, to hinder the dislocation to move, like for example grain boundaries, precipitates, or other dislocations. And with this, I think we can conclude the general behavior which we see in a tensile test. Here, at the point of yield, this is the beginning or the start of single dislocation gliding. During work hardening, this is the phase where dislocation multiplication happens from, remember, one kilometer up to 10,000 kilometer total length of dislocation lines in a pin head. And in the end, at the maximum, there is obviously an equilibrium between dislocation multiplication, the generation of new dislocation, and dislocation annihilation at the boundaries, at the surfaces. You cannot produce more dislocations at that point, and that's why at the end the, uh, the specimen show necking and finally break. Can we also explain the temperature dependence? I think, yes, we can. The strength decreases with temperature. That's clear now, because dislocation can glide much easier at higher temperature. That's obvious, because they are much easier to move to the expanding lattice. So with higher temperature, strength goes down. That's explainable by that. The uniform elongation goes also down with temperature. This means that dislocations annihilate more often at higher temperatures, so there is not enough strength for, or not enough dislocation there for plastic deformation. That's why there is also a reduction. And well, so as a conclusion, with rising temperature, work hardening decreases and ductility increases. If we compare different metals with different lattices, then you usually observe the following. Um, BCC structured metals show only a small or a, a, a low range of work hardening. If you compare them to FCC, face and not cubic structured metals, they show an immense area and an immense high amount of work hardening. Can we explain this? Of course we can explain this, otherwise I wouldn't show you. If you compare FCC again with BCC materials, and remember that the dislocations are bound to specific gliding planes, then all we have to do, we have to count the possibilities for each case, how many directions and planes are available in each structure. If we do this for um, FCC, then you see the uh, closest packed planes in an FCC lattice is the 111 plane. Here we have the closest packed planes. And there are exactly four of these planes in an elementary cell. So we have, as main gliding planes, four. The same 
is valid for uh, hexagonally closed packed uh, lattices, but here the closest packed uh, plane is the base plane, so here we have only one possibility for sliding planes. If we have a look on BCC structured metals, we see there is nothing like a closest packed plane because uh, BCC uh, structured lattices don't have this. So we don't have a closed, uh, a closest packed planes. We only have something which is comparable. This is the 110 plane. This is the uh, w which comes nearest to the closest packed planes. So these 110 planes, there are six in an elementary cell. That's why we write here number six. Now let's have a look on the gliding directions. Again, in FCC, gliding happens in the direction where the atoms are closest packed on a line. And in this plane here, these lines exactly the outer lines of the triangle here. These are the closest packed directions. These are the 110 directions. So there are three possibilities where gliding can take place preferably. Again, in the hexagonally closed packed, we also have these three directions in the base plane. So three possible directions. But in the BCC lattice, there are only two possibilities. That's the uh, diagonal in the elementary cell, the 111 directions. Here we have three atoms in a line, so there are only two possibilities. So the total possibilities for gliding are multiplication of the main gliding planes and gliding directions. Therefore, we end up with 12 possibilities in the FCC metal only three possibilities for the hexagonally closed pack, and also 12 possibilities for BCC. But here we have to take into account that the gliding planes are not closest packed. So it needs more energy to drive dislocations through these gliding planes. And this is the explanation why work hardening in FCC metals is much higher than in BCC and uh, very low in HCP structured lattices. This means FCC metals are rather ductile because they have many easy glide possibilities. For BCC, they are also rather ductile, but not as ductile as FCC because it needs more energy to drive these dislocations through these 12 possibilities. And HCC metals are in general not so ductile because we have only three possibilities for the movement. Conclusion of all that and important, how can we increase the strengths in metals or harden the metals? The answer is easy, by preventing or restraining dislocation gliding. If we are able to do that, this makes the material strong. As options, you know, cold work, that's one option. We can bend the lattice by a large substitute, by, by uh, big atoms. Um, building them into the lattice. This is uh, usually called solid solution. Or we can create obstacles like small interstitial atoms or precipitates. Or we can increase the grain boundaries, which means we can reduce the grain sizes. So we produce many, many obstacles for the dislocations. In mild steels, you often observe uh, lunar spans that's uh, stable necking during deformation. Also, this is now easily explainable because dislocations have to move in order to show plastic deformation. But in this case of the mild steels, there are clouds of small atoms, that's the carbon atoms, and dislocations have to move through these clouds. And these clouds are more or less uh, small obstacles, and that's why we show that. Uh, we see uh, these lunar spans during the deformation that simply dislocation trying to move through such clouds. Then the other 
basic hardening mechanisms, solid solution hardening. This is, uh, you see an increase of strength by solid solution hardening, which is proportional to the square of the impurity content. Then uh, the other possibility, we mentioned grain hardening. If you reduce the grain size, that's the famous whole patch relation. So the increase in strength is proportional, inversely proportional to the grain size uh, with the square root. All these are material constants, you can forget them. And the third possibility is dispersion strengthening. If we produce precipitates or whatever uh, different atoms in a lattice, then uh, they could, there could be a coherent or a semi-coherent or an incoherent phase transition between uh, these materials. And these are natural, natural obstacles for dislocations. You can see here many dislocation lines. They are bond or fixed to these points. These are precipitates. So depending on the size, phase, boundary uh, of the dislocations, uh, there are two mechanisms. One is also famous Orwan law. This is a circumvention mechanism. And also thinkable if we have coherent obstacles, then dislocations finally can cut through these obstacles, but the result is the same. It needs much more force to drive the dislocations through the obstacles, and this is what increases the strength in materials. Also here we can uh, make a very simple model. I have modeled here uh, iron lattice and introduced a ball of tungsten atoms, shifted the ball a bit, misoriented both lattices and compressed everything, relaxed everything. And here I think it is pretty nicely seen that around this so-called precipitate or tungsten ball, the iron lattice is distorted immensely. It's not regular anymore. And also you see here at that area, we have an incoherent transition also here and there. And otherwise, there is a, the lattices are coherent. So all in all, that's what we call a semi-coherent uh, phase transition. And to overcome or walk through such an obstacle, it needs much more force on a dislocation. And this is, in the end, what brings the hardening. If you reduce the size of the blue ball down to one single tungsten atom. There is also a distortion of the lattice, but we wouldn't see it as nicely as here. So this is the general effect of hardening. How does this affect the fracture properties? This is another movie of a Joppy impact test. On the left-hand side, you see a fast fracture, and on the right-hand side, ductile fracture. Both is the same material, but made at different temperatures. And this you already know. There are materials which break brittle at low temperatures and ductile at high. And there are materials or metals which never break brittle, independent of the temperature. Usually you test this by Joppy tests. Here we have the energy of the pendulum, which or the energy which is absorbed in the material, in the specimen during deformation. And you make a lot of tests, combine or draw a fitting lines through all the tests or test results. And a very general observation is that metals with FCC lattice don't show this ductile to brittle transition and metals with BCC lattice, they show such a transition. In the lower range of the energy, we see fast fracture. In the higher range or upper shelf, we observe ductile fracture. And if a material shows a transition, it's right in the middle between ductile and fast fracture. This is what usually is called DPDT, or 
ductile to brittle transition temperature. If you read some physics papers also, then often they call it BDTT. Physicists uh, tend to express themselves in another way. I don't know why, but just in case you hear that, uh, brittle to ductile transition, that's physics. Ductile to brittle, that's engineering. OK, the fracture surface. In the fast fracture, we see most often transgranular cleavage fracture. This means the fracture goes right through all grains. And in the scanning electron, uh, electron microscope, you see these large flat areas. Whereas in, in a deformation fracture, in a ductile fracture, you see a very rough surface with a lot of dimples in it. And you can already guess from that that there must be a large amount of plastic deformation going on while the fracture goes through the material. A simulation by finite elements shows what you probably all know already, if you are familiar with design. And uh, one of the basic rules is to avoid notches in any design. Smooth transitions or large radius are much more preferable than sharp, sharp notches because at the tip or at the end of these sharp notches, we observe a local stress increasement due to the notch. If we have here, for example, a notch or a crack tip, then locally around this crack tip, the uh, stress increases immensely. That's a simple fact. And if you see, at some point, the stress is higher than yield strength. And this means at a distance from the crack tip to this line here, there must be plastic deformation directly at the crack tip. So the material deforms plastically here. If it deforms plastically here, that's the same as strain hardening. So the strength of the material goes up. Yield strength also goes up then the plastic zone reduces a little bit. But nevertheless, you have to permanently put energy into the deformation of the crack tip in order, oops, in order to proceed in this direction. So this is the case for plastic deformation or uh, plastic or crack propagation by plastic tearing which you create these rough surfaces in pure metals. If there are some precipitates or uh, other features in the material, but let's stay to precipitates, then uh, we observe within this plastic zone also deformation of the material around these precipitates. They uh, create some voids, some uh, holes around these precipitates which combine and which finally blunt also the crack tip and in the end uh, are resulting in an immense plastic deformation and this roughened surface we have uh, seen in the scanning electron microscopy pictures. So high deformation energy produces the rough surfaces and in generally you need much energy to crack such ductile materials. In fracture mechanics, um, let's assume we are studying brittle materials like ceramics. Then uh, for ceramic materials or very brittle materials, yield strengths and ultimate tensile strengths are the same because they fracture within the elastic deformation range. So the critical stress intensity factor for a material is the square root of Young's modulus and the material property called fracture resistance. This you can look up in any textbook. That's a simple fact. But the load of a pre-cracked material is calculated by the stress intensity factor, which is the product of, in that case for brittle material, the yield strengths. Uh, and the square root of P times the crack length. 
and a geometry factor depending on the load of the specimen or your component. And if the K value is higher than the critical K value, we uh, observe a fracture. So KC is a measure for fracture toughness. That's the usual uh, system in fracture mechanics. And high strength materials are prone to fracture due to their high yield strengths because if you have here an already high value, the critical crack length cannot be as high. So the size of the plastic zone you can also calculate by these equations and the size of the black plastic zone is proportional to the quotient of uh, stress intensity factor and yield strength every, and, and the same thing squared. So as a conclusion, the softer the material with lower yield strength, the larger the plastic zone. But in a brittle material, the uh, stress increase due to the pre-crack or, or, or notch is so high that we come near the theoretical strengths, at least in ceramics. And so you can virtually interpret this that the atomic bounds are cracked. And that's why we have no or a very, very small plastic zone compared to the ductile material with very high local stresses. And that's why we observed this cleavage fracture. With this, we can explain ductile fracture because we, there are large plastic zones around the crack tips. And this requires a high amount of deformation energy. That's why in the Sharpie test we have these high energy values. And there is also the explanation of cleavage fracture in the brittle materials where we have almost no plastic zones which uh, lead to very high local stresses and therefore straight intergranular fracture. Do we have an explanation for the ductile brittle precision with our picture of these locations? You know, as soon as there is plastic deformation, these locations have to move through the lattice. Otherwise, we don't, didn't see this. And we already have learned that at higher temperature, these locations glide easier. So at high temperature, we don't expect uh, brittle behavior because these locations can move easy. But especially in BCC metals, where it needs, in general, more energy to drive the dislocations <coughs> through, this, through the lattice, at lower temperature, the energy is too high to drive them. And this is what, in the end, uh, prevents them from moving, and this leads to the brittle fracture. So what can we conclude with respect to design? For low temperature application, it's maybe better to use FCC-structured alloys. And there are some prominent examples, for example, austenitic stainless steels. You all know, or maybe you don't, I don't know, but in cooling applications, say liquid gas containers or your refrigerator or things like that, all low temperature application austenitic stainless steel is used because this type of steel doesn't show DBDT. You can go down with temperature as far as you want or at least down to liquid nitrogen temperatures and the steel behaves always <coughs> ductile. So just in a case of accident, if a liquid nitrogen container uh, falls off a transportation or whatever, it doesn't crack. It just plastically deforms, but it, it's still uh, tight. It doesn't leak. If you would do this with a uh, mild steel or ferritic steel, if it falls off a car, it would immediately break because at such low temperature, it's rather brittle. Another conclusion is to increase toughness. The material has to be softened. And if you remember what I mentioned uh, with regard to tungsten, the problem or the wrong idea was to alloy tungsten with uh, other elements. This reduced the grains. So in principle, this hardened 
the material and you cannot expect material being softer if you harden it. Yeah, that's a contradiction. So it was the wrong idea. We had to soften tungsten instead of to harden them if you would like to have better ductility. Strength and toughness, toughness or ductility, that's more or less the same, are contradicting properties. You can't have both. If you have a strength, high strength material, it usually is brittle and vice versa. If you have a very tough material, it usually is soft. All these properties have been related to low usual or medium temperatures. Let's say for steels up to 200 C or so. But what happens if we go further up with temperature in the material? If we do this and let's say we construct a test like the tensile test but instead of constantly straining the specimen, we just keep a constant load on the specimen. Put the whole thing on a, in a test machine, use weights on top, and wait what happens. Well, you can wait until the end of time, nothing happens, you, you know this. Now you put the whole thing in a furnace and increase the temperature. And at temperatures approximately 0 0.3, 0 0.4 of the absolute melting temperature, something strange is happening. The specimen is elongating with time, like here shown in the principal curve. It's strained, it's elongated with time. And this behavior, you all, you all know it already, that's what we call creep materials. So even if the stress initially put on the specimen is around or even lower as yield stress where you wouldn't expect uh, plastic deformation, if the temperature is high enough, plastic deformation happens anyway and that's called creep. Creep is subdivided into three stages. There is the primary creep uh, in that, uh, during that phase, the dislocation, multiplication and annihilation uh, goes to equilibrium and if the rate of annihilation and uh, multiplication is the same, <laughs> then there is a <coughs> elongated time period where we see a constant strain rate and Somewhere near the end of the test, strain rate accelerates and leads to final fracture of the specimen. As a conclusion, if at lower temperature nothing happens and only at higher temperature something happens, what is the basic mechanism? There is only one way. It must be dependent on diffusion. Otherwise, there would be no reason that we see uh, deformation in such, during such a test. So this is very important. Diffusion and creep are connected in a way. And let's see how it is. First, a few principal things. If you have here uh, the logarithm of stress and here logarithm of time. That's the usual way of describing creep tests. And you are doing these tests with uh, at different temperatures than uh, compared to the tensile tests. We have three dimensions or at least two dependencies. It depends on stress and on temperature, that's clear. So if we would at the same time, uh, at this, uh, with the same load, reduce the temperature, you expect a higher time until the specimen fractures. Or if you increase the temperature further, then 
diffusion slower. We have seen it has to be connected in some way. So it needs even more time until the specimen fractures. And this is for constant stress, which is relatively easy. What happens if you want the specimen to be to fracture always at the same time? You have to increase the stress, but at the same time you have to decrease the temperature. So here we have constant time and it's dependent on stress and on temperature. This is in general uh, the problematic with creep. You are, there are two uh, axes which you have to consider. Sometimes it's much e easier to consider or to focus only on the creep rate. That's the velocity with which the specimen is elongated during the second stage of the creep. <laughs> and if you write it down um, epsilon point, that's, this, uh, th that's the creep rate and the stress double logarithmic notation, you see a general behavior. There is one straight line for the higher stresses and another one with a different uh, angle at lower stresses. Straight lines in double logarithmic notation means um, exponential law, so um, the creep strain rate is proportional to the stress uh, with an uh, exponent n. In the higher stress range, n is in the range of, well, much more than 3, but typically 8 or 6 to 8 in steels, for example. And at the low stress tail, n is only in the order of 1. So there are two different mechanisms in creep. The question is, why? To explain that, we have to go back to the diffusion. Diffusion in the lattice. And now you have to imagine everything <coughs> from the point of view from a single atom. If you were an atom, where would you go on your way through a lattice? Well. If it was up to me, I would go the easiest way, as always. And the easiest way is there where, we, where I have room and where is space. And where do we have that? One possibility is at the grain boundaries, because here is a grain boundary. Two different oriented lattices don't fit together perfectly, so there is much room for me to go through there. So this is a typical fast diffusion corridor. That's a two-dimensional degrain boundary. If I was an atom, I would easily go or walk along grain boundaries. But another possibility is on the tip or on the core of a dislocation. This here is a dislocation line. And you see here at the end of the dislocation or around the dislocation core, there is also room. This is not in two dimensions. This is in one dimension. So. This is uh, like a tube. So for me, as an atom, it would be very easily to follow along dislocation lines. And that's exactly what happens during creep. We have a lot of dislocation or grain boundary diffusion. Now, imagine you are a dislocation. You want to move through the lattice. But sooner or later, you are facing an obstacle, like here. That's a precipitate. And you can't move through that because it's so hard and, well, you can't go through it. But on the other hand, you are bound and fixed to the gliding plane. So in principle, there is no way. It's usually at low temperature, this is the end of a dislocation. It's blocked and that's it. But now in creep, or for creep mechanisms, we have these higher temperatures and a lot of diffusion, and especially along, as we have seen, dislocation cores. There is a lot of diffusion. And um, somebody is pushing me, being a dislocation, from the back, 
And well, as a result, you see here, I experienced also a force which wanted me to push up over this precipitate, but I cannot because I'm bound to my gliding plane. That's the situation. Now what's happening? Since we have a lot of diffusion possibilities along this dislocation line and this dislocation experience a force upward, then the, all the atoms at the, top, at, at the bottom of, of this dislocation or dislocation core can simply move away. Or vacancy, that's a missing atom in the atom, can diffuse there. And as a result, the, f the formerly straight dislocation line can be bended by diffusion over the obstacle, just like shown here. This is the gliding direction. Formerly it was a straight line and the precipitate blocked my way, but now just around this precipitate, the dislocation, that's me again, can climb up and then the path is free and then I can move away. And this is exactly what is happening during creep. Blocked dislocations can by diffusion climb over obstacles and then glide until they face the next obstacle or grain boundary or whatever. <laughs> and at uh, the lower temperatures in creep, 0.3 to 0.4 or something like that of melting temperature, the diffusion happens through this dislocation course and at some higher temperature we have also dislocation diffusion through the crystal. That's one creep mechanism. Climb and glide. Climb and glide. And that's also the reason why we have over time constantly deformation or what we uh, call creep. That's uh, creep by climb. Climb again is only possible by diffusion and then again glide. This explains uh, the part of the uh, higher amount of stresses. For the lower part, with low stresses, the stress is so low that it is even too low to move dislocations. But still we observe creep deformation. So if creep deformation doesn't depend on dislocation movement, then the only remaining mechanism is diffusion. Diffusion without dislocation movement. And this can be imagined or described by this picture. If we have a grain and the grain is stressed in this way, it faces a compressive stress on that way. To solve this solution or to solve this stressing and straining Diffusion has to take place either along grain boundaries from the compressive part to the tensile part or through dislocations and through the lattice uh, also from that part to that part. This means creep by diffusion and not by dislocation movement. As a result, the grain is deformed. It's elongated in the direction of the tensile stress. And if the grains are deformed, they don't fit together anymore. So an additional mechanism has to take place. The grains have to slide along the grain boundaries in order to prevent producing holes. So creep by diffusion and grain boundary gliding, that's the result where we have very, very low stresses but high temperatures. In a few words, the models are, can be concluded or described by two parts. One is creep by dislocation climb. If it's, the, if it's based on lattice diffusion, which means higher temperature, then uh, sigma uh, with an exponent n for core diffusion, which means lower temperature. As exponent, we have n plus 2. And for the creep diffusion, if we summarize again 
lattice diffusion or drain boundary diffusion in one expression. Forget about everything else, just concentrate here. This is the creep rate, that's the velocity of the specimen elongating, and it depends or it's proportional to the stress, that's all. But it is also inverse proportional to the grain size squared. So here you can very easily conclude a material with big or with big grains leads to a much lower creep deformation at these higher temperatures. So, creep-resistant materials, if you have to select them for an application, they should have, uh, should have low diffusion coefficients because this in general prevents creep. Low diffusion coefficients mean you have a high melting point in the material or you have to use a low a total grain boundary surface in your material. This means for creep, larger grains, are much better than fine grains. An additional measure to improve creep resistance is to introduce many obstacles for the dislocation movements. This means that you have to produce stable precipitates in your materials or that's also known as oxide dispersion strengthening in materials. And in general, obstacle to hinder grain boundary gliding means if possible, you should produce a material which uh, forms precipitates at the grain boundaries. Then the friction is higher for the, this, for the grain boundaries to move. So you see, with a few basic mechanisms, you can explain the whole field <coughs> of material development and also design application and material selection. So let's come to a still another quite different type of loading. That's fatigue and the fatigue properties. Up to now, we have strained or stressed the materials constantly. But there are many applications where uh, your parts are facing cyclic stress or cyclic strain loading. And let's start with materials which are free of cracks. It's perfect surfaces and everything is perfect. If you load them cyclic by a stress like that, and you count the number of cycles until your specimen fails or breaks, then you see in general two typical areas. One is up to about 10,000 numbers of cycles to failure and the other one is uh, more than 10,000 cycles. Here we have again double logarithmic notation. Here the delta sigma, that's uh, the one part of the cyclic loading and uh, down here the number of cycles until failure occurs. So you see this two areas are separated. If the total stress your specimen sees exceeds yield strength, then you are in the range which shows this curve. And if the total stress is always below yield strength, then you are on this range. This one is called low cycle fatigue, the other one high cycle fatigue. During low cycle fatigue, the material is plastically or partly plastically deformed. And under high cycle fatigue, the deformation is, at least at the beginning, only within the plastic range. Description of this is, uh, I don't know the, remember the name, but it's quite simple. For uh, the same loading, but instead of stress, we use now cyclic strain loading. This means the specimen is always deformed for a few millimeters to the right, compressed a few millimeters to the left. So 
epsilon is the defining boundary and you measure the strain as a response of the material. Again, you see in double logarithmic notation about the same behavior. There is a low cycle fatigue regime. And um, also here, of course, the stress exceeds yield strength. And the Manson-Coffin law, that's uh, the same thing like before, except of delta sigma, <coughs> we have here delta epsilon. Um, that's the typical description of such low cycle fatigue tests or material behavior. This is for materials which are free of cracks. Now what happens if you have a part which already has a small crack and it is cyclic loaded? Then you would expect the crack to proceed from step to step or by time. But here it of course depends on the loading situation and as we have seen uh, in comparison with fracture mechanics here we don't need sigma and epsilon we need the stress intensity factor this uh, has to be calculated for a specific loading situation and there is also one thing with cracks a crack can only propagate if you load them under tensile stress. If you push the crack together, which means compressive loading, then of course it doesn't propagate, it cannot propagate. So under cyclic loading, you can forget this compression times, because under compression the crack doesn't propagate, only under tensile load. So this means if you have a cyclic stress with a mean value of zero, which means tensile, compressive, tensile, compressive. Only the tensile parts contribute to the elongation or to the propagation of the crack. If you have a permanently cyclic loading under tensile, then uh, the propagation, of course, is much more faster or is faster. So cracks grow only under tensile load. What does it mean? If you have a material with cracks and you observe the crack propagation speed or the crack propagation rate, and uh, again, double logarithmic notation, usually it needs a specific intensity factor at all to propagate the crack at all, to start crack propagation. If the intensity factor is too low and you have small cracks, then uh, the cracks immediately stop somewhere. This could be also precipitates or other things where cracks cannot uh, proceed anymore. So this is the green part. For the red part, crack propagation speed, let's say, this is described by the Paris law and for the short cracks and very low intensity straight, uh, uh, stress factors. Um, Ogawa and Tokai law describes that. Now let's look at the surface. We do such a test with a perfect material with no cracks at the beginning on the surface and step by step here we have uh, 2,000 cycles, 4,000 cycles, 6,000 cycles. At 9,000 cycles, you see already cracks appearing at the surface here. And if you proceed further, 11,000 cycles, there is already starting a cracking network. And at 13,000 cycles, you see definitely a very big network of many, many cracks. What you can, this is what you see at the surface. In the volume, if you cut the specimen through and see what the crack does within the lattice or in, in the material, you see that the crack can stop at the grain boundary, for example. But also a crack can propagate along the grain boundary and change its direction. And now again, the question of all this materials behaviors, how can we explain it? 
A simple model is that on a perfect surface, again, gliding due to um, plastic deformation appears at the surface, but it appears under tensile and under compression load. So we have gliding during the tensile phase and we have gliding backward during the compression phase and with time during the gliding back and forth very very small micro cracks develop and appear and then you know if you have a small crack and uh, loading there is plas plas uh, a plastic zone development with even higher stresses and this even leads to more crack uh, propagation and this is exactly how the model works. Stage one, along the gliding planes, preferably on the 45 degrees to the surface, we have extrusion and intrusion of gliding planes which <coughs> lead to micro crack formation that we have seen on the surface. Some kinds, if there are precipitates or strong grain boundaries, at least at lower loads, cracks could stop or could be stopped, micro crack development could be stopped uh, by such features. In stage two, these micro cracks behave like any other crack and they develop by crack propagation, they form a network and, well, parallel or perpendicular to the loading direction, they develop and this means in the material a cracking network. The crack growth model could also be easily imagined if we have a pure metal and we have already a micro crack or a, a bigger crack, what happens under tensile load? The crack will be deformed in this way, so the radius on the crack tip is increased simply by this formula, P times delta half. Uh, here we have the plastic zone, that's uh, not interesting or it doesn't matter. So if the surface of the crack tip is increased and you compress it again, then the increased surface results in a crack elongation. That's exactly the half of that amount because uh, the elongation has the versus divided by two. So crack elong uh, crack elongation in one cycle is P times delta, delta being the, the crack radius divided by four and since P is approximately four the uh, crack propagation speed is roughly delta. So which e with each cycle the crack steps by step develops. If we have precipitates in the material then in addition to the crack tip elongation we also produce as we have seen some voids or uh, around this precipitates which merge together and in that case the crack tip formation or uh, speed is higher than delta. So with precipitates or fine precipitates, in general, the crack rate for propagation is higher than without, than in pure metals. And if you have a look on the crack surface, this mirrors on this typical bands in this uh, fatigue fractures. Wherever you see them, there are always these bands also here in bolts or uh, yeah, many different kind of applications. And if you look them on them with a uh, uh, high magnified or higher magnification, you can even see the step by step propagation of the crack tip through the material, through the fracture. Let's have a breeze and go one step further. This was low cycle fatigue, fatigue in general, 
crack propagation, and so on. But now imagine you measure all these cycles of load up to 5,000 or so, and uh, you get always such hysteresis curves. And what you see now for that example of 9% chromium steel, if you perform a strain controlled LCF, low cycle fatigue test, that always the maximum point in tensile load and the maximum point in under compression load, that they move downward and upward. Or in other words, the material becomes softer and softer with proceeding cycles. This is a typical behavior of, for example, 9% chromium steels. And this is shown in the picture here. But materials with low dislocation densities, which means materials which don't produce or which initially don't have many dislocations inside, uh, here we see a cyclic hardening. So with time during the cyclic load, the measured maximum tensile stress goes higher and the, measurement, uh, and the measured uh, uh, compression stress goes down to the negative. Th that's hardening. And a typical example for this material are all metals which are FCC structure. Again, you remember FCC pronounces dislocation multiplication and here in that case during this cyclic loading you produce more and more dislocations and this finally leads to hardening during cyclic loading. Materials with a higher dislocation density from the start, that's the BCC materials, due to the multiple movement and gliding of the dislocation, the dislocation annihilate more, dislocation density goes down, and that's why these materials show cyclic softening during the LCF tests. So in conclusion, two material groups, one is hardening under cyclic loading, the other one softening. Here you see it again, here we have uh, Tensile and compression tests in red and blue, they are almost the same, which they should. And with time, they go down for 9% chromium <coughs> steels until the fracture. And in the microstructure, you see here, initially, there are more dislocation as compared to near the end, where the grains are almost dislocation-free. That's the <coughs> rough basic explanation for this material behavior. And if you concentrate here in this figure, which shows again stress over number of cycles in LCF for 9% chromium steel, and uh, compared with an oxide dispersion strengthen steel, red compared to the oxide dispersion strengthen variant, and here green compared to the other green oxide dispersion strengthen steels. You see the fracture time is almost the same for all these materials. That uh, was a trick of the uh, tests we have done. But in comparison you see that this oxide dispersion leads to a much higher possible stress. So in general if you have material with lots of precipitates or uh, oxide persons inside the material. This means without reducing the number of cycles to failure, you can stress the material much more. It can uh, experience much higher loads. And again, this is useful for some designs. So a fatigue tolerant design means avoid rough surfaces because this uh, prevents an easy micro crack formation at the surface. Of course you have also to avoid notches, that's a general rule. Uh, so perfectly polished surfaces are the best for any component which has to be designed fatigue tolerant. For materials this means 
if you have a part which is cyclic, uh, low cycle fatigue loaded, soft materials are in general uh, better, but they can be improved by uh, oxide dispersion strengthened or precipitation hardened uh, features. For high cyclic fatigue, which means the material is loaded only within the elastic range, uh, very high strength materials like, for example, ceramics or so are not a bad choice. And the ODS limits crack growth if, if you have oxide dispersion strengths and steels like for, like, for example, then uh, crack growth has been or will be reduced below a threshold, which is also good for the lifetime of your component. Unexpectedly, we are at the end. <laughs> now it's time for questions, I think. Okay. Seems you have had a good time because I didn't show you something new. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, I have a small question. So, if uh, you want to develop a material, so for example, for uh, for cycling applications, okay, which is going to be subject to to different cycles. Would you think in a nanostructure material to, to be better than a coarse grain material or do you think uh, that nanomaterials have some advantage concerning to this point? I don't think there is an easy and short answer because it depends on many other boundary conditions. In, in general, uh, nanostructured materials are not only um, harder, but they are, only, uh, are also more ductile. And so I would guess for cyclic loading, let's say for um, low cycle fatigue, they should be much better. But uh, again, it depends on many other things like temperature and what type of material. But in general, I would say yes. OK, thank you. Okay, let's have a break.